Namaste. Welcome to the introduction to the fourth chapter of Katupanishad. So before we get to the first verse, let's take a look at Shankaracharya's introduction. It has been stated, He is hidden in all beings, hence he does not appear as the self of all, but he is seen through a pointed and fine intellect. Katupanishad 1.3.12 What is the obstacle to this pointed intellect because of which there is an absence of that intellect and the self is not seen? This canto is begun to show the cause of that non-perception. For only when the cause that bars the good is known can effort be made to remove it. Now the point he makes here is very salient. If Brahman is the self of all, and if he is within everything that exists, why don't we see him? Why aren't we aware of Brahman in ordinary life? Well, there must be something blocking that vision. There must be some obstacle. So this whole chapter is about that obstacle and leads to a discussion of how to remove it. We have had a similar discussion before in terms of the grantis, the knots in the spinal channels. But this is a different point of view, a fresh point of view on the same topic. So here's the verse. Aharan chikani vyatrinat svayangu stas mat paran pasyati nantaratman kaschidira pratyagatmana maiksha davrita chakshuram ritatva mitchan. The self existent Lord destroyed the outgoing senses. Therefore, one sees the outer things and not the inner self. A rare, discriminating man desiring immortality turns his eyes away and then sees the indwelling self. Shankaracharya's Tika Paranchi, outgoing. By the word Kani, Ka, meaning an orifice, cavity, are referred to the senses, such as ear, etc., which are suggestively indicated by it. They surely proceed outward for revealing their objects, sound, etc. E. Vyatrinat afflicted, that is, killed these, since they are of such a nature. Who is he that did so? Svayambhu. The great Lord who, Bhu, exists ever, and Svayam by himself, on his own right, and not subject to anything else, since he injured them. Tasmat, therefore, the perceiver, the individual, Pashyati, sees, perceives. Parak, the outer, sounds, etc., which are the non-self, and exists as external things but sees na antaratman, not the inner self. Though such is the nature of man, yet, like reversing the current of a river, kahachidhiraha, some rare discriminating man sees pratyagatmanam, the indwelling self. That which is pratyak in the interior, and at the same time atma, the self is the pratyagatma. In common usage, the word atma conventionally means only the individual soul and not anything else. From the point of etymology, too, the word atma has that very sense. For in the smriti, the derivation of the word is given thus. Since it pervades, absorbs, and enjoys all objects in the world, and since from it the world derives its continuous existence, therefore is it called the Atma. Linga Purana 17096. That indwelling self, 
one's own reality, one aikshat saw, that is, sees, for in the Vedas there is no regularity about the tenses. How one sees that self is being stated, becoming avrita chakshuhu, having one's eyes covered, that is, having the sense organs beginning with the eye turned away from all sense objects. Such a one who is purified thus sees the indwelling self. For it is not possible for the same person to be engaged in the thought of sense objects and to have the vision of the self as well. Why, again, should the discriminating man check his natural propensity thus through great effort and then realize the self? This is the answer. It chan, desiring for oneself, amritatvam, immortality, one's own unchanging nature. So briefly then, why don't we see the indwelling self? Well, because our vision isn't pointed in that direction. <laughs> our attention is going out through the senses onto the sense objects in the world. Now, of course, this is known as Jagrat consciousness. And basically, almost all the beings in this world are in Jagrat. Only a few begin to investigate the inner realms. And of course, the first thing they encounter is Swapna. Swapna consciousness or dreams, dreams and thoughts. Now, Wise men and intellectuals and religionists have been caught up in speculation about the meaning of dreams, the meaning of thoughts, the meaning of prayer, how it all works, and its relationship to God and everything like that. But because they don't have the wisdom of the Upanishads, they wind up having to fall back on their own intelligence, which is very limited. Human intelligence is well known <laughs> for being limited and uh, inaccurate. I mean, take a look at your own life. How many times in a day even have you been wrong about something? Well, I thought this was going to happen, but something else happened instead. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves and if we observe ourselves in an unbiased way, with clarity, it happens numerous times a day, doesn't it? Now, of course, the mind wants to preserve its image of itself. The ego wants to think, oh, yeah, I know what's going on, you know? Like, uh, oh, yeah, that, I intended that. Yeah, that's what I expected to happen. When actually you had something else completely in mind. <laughs> So, what happens is, when we are wrong, when one of our predictions or one of our desires doesn't come true, we simply make up another one on the spot and say, oh yeah, well that's really what I wanted. Or we just cover it over with a completely new desire and divert our attention somewhere else. You know, the mind is famous for jumping all over the universe. So that's what happens. We divert our attention to something outside that actually has nothing to do with what we thought even a minute ago. Isn't it? So what to speak of this human intelligence? If we try to approach the Supreme Brahman by our limited intelligence, we're going to fail. In fact, without some external clue, we don't even realize there is such a thing as Brahman. I don't think anyone can claim that they figured this out by themselves. At some point, there has to be the revelation of the scriptures or of someone who has already realized Brahman based on the scriptures. That's the only way we would ever figure out that there is such a thing as Brahman, even though we ourselves and our own self 
are nothing but Brahman. It uh, really is amusing to think of this, that we all go through life looking outward instead of looking inward, and so we completely miss who and what we really are. Uh, there was that enlightened uh, fellow out in California, uh, Bhagavan No Me, huh? and he called his day of enlightenment the day of laughter. Because when you realize what's been going on, what a cosmic joke has been pulled over your eyes, you have to laugh. I mean, it's either laugh or cry, you know, take your pick. Most of us choose laughter because once one knows Brahman, then there's no more fear, no more uncertainty. The final goal of the mind is finally known. So this gives a great sense of peace. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And one sees one's former state of mind being in anxiety about, oh, am I going to finish my sadhana? Am I going to get the result of my meditation? Am I going to get this material thing and that material thing? <laughs> As just ridiculous, laughable, uh, insane. So like I said, the only thing you can do is either cry or laugh. And the laughter is much better because that's the mood of Brahman. Brahman is carefree. Brahman is light and playful. Brahman is not attached. Brahman is eternal. Never born, never dies. Indestructible. Can't be destroyed by anything. So with that kind of confidence, with that kind of realization of who we are, then one can go ahead with great certainty and live one's life in such a way as to reach final enlightenment when one not only knows that one is Brahman, but actually perceives and experiences oneself as Brahman. But there is, besides our own inattention to the matter and our own uh, lack of knowledge, <laughs> ignorance, and our own occupation or preoccupation with desires and material stuff and sense objects, there's one more factor. Here's a very interesting verse from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. This self was indeed Brahman in the beginning. It knew only itself as I am Brahman. Therefore it became all. And whoever among the gods knew it also became that, and the same with sages and men. And to this day, whoever in like manner knows it as I am Brahman, becomes all this universe. Even the gods cannot prevail against him, for he becomes their self. While he who worships another god, thinking he is one and I am another, does not know. He is like an animal to the gods. As many animals serve a man, so does each man serve the gods. Even if one animal is taken away, it causes anguish. What should one say of many animals? Therefore it is not liked by them that men should know this. Brihadara Nyakopanishad 1, 4, 10 We are livestock. We are cattle. We are called Pashu. Pashu means animal, specifically a domestic animal, because Pashu means a rope or a snare. And when you have a cow or another animal, you put a rope around its neck to guide it here and there. So we are Pashu to the gods. We are literally their servants and even their food. As one is perfectly capable of killing and eating domestic animals kept on a farm or something like that, so the gods are perfectly capable of eating the subtle bodies of the human beings when they die. And this indeed is what happens at the time of death. And that's why we don't remember our previous births. 
that the subtle bodies are torn apart and consumed by the gods. After all, they have no need of gross nourishment. That uh, is recycled in the biosphere here on Earth. But the subtle bodies are consumed by the gods and then we have to go through a series of conditionings to prepare us for the next body. And for most people, the next body is going to be an animal birth because they live like animals in this life. And this is the judgment. This is Yamaraj's job. Yamaraj judges the living being when he leaves the body that has he lived as a human being or as an animal? And of course, one who simply lives to serve the senses is no better than an animal. Though he may walk on two legs, have all kinds of college degrees, be very wealthy or powerful or whatever on this earth, when this body is finished, he becomes simply chattel to the gods. Chattel means livestock, like cattle. So in this way, the degraded living beings, the, the degraded human beings who live like animals, then come to grief in the subtle world. They go to the moon, and then they have to return to the earth. Whereas those who are on the path of self-realization, even if they're not perfectly complete, go by the path of the sun to the higher planets. Now they can go step by step from one higher planet to the next until they reach Brahmaloka, or they can simply go in one leap to the uh, Brahman world, world of Brahman, the pure creation, the world of Saguna Brahman, Devi or Shakti. That's a very wonderful world. But even more wonderful is the world of the self, Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, without any qualities, because this is the source of everything else, including the worlds of the lesser Brahman and so forth. So therefore, the rest of this chapter is going to be about these obstacles that keep us from self-realization and keep us engaged with the external senses so that we can overcome them and finish our sadhana and attain the highest enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.